Well, this morning, if you would, our text this morning comes from Colossians chapter 1. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, verses, 12, verses 12 through 14, though we certainly will keep this in context as we're looking at the Apostle Paul's prayer for the Colossian church and really drawing from it uh, as a model for us or an example of instruction to us as we observe the Apostle Paul's prayer uh, for the Colossian believers. And I think giving us really some rich insight into how we can pray for one another and not just what we can pray for one another but how we pray for one another in the activity of the heart and that is in believing in confidence and in thanksgiving uh, for what God is doing and what God has done uh, what God will do uh, in terms of w the work that he is doing within the body of, of Christ and for the Colossian church, you know, this is a church that when you, you see what the Paul is uh, really boasting about uh, in the, the opening lines of this letter, you say, well, here's a church, what would you pray for them? It seems like they got it all together. And the Apostle Paul, and I think you get this strong message also in Philippians, you know, you're, you, yeah, you're, you're, really, you're really thriving as a church, but there's more. You know, it's kind of like that endo, endless infomercial on TV, right? So there's always more. But with Christ, there always is more. There always is a deeper, richer, more precious relationship that we can have in, in abiding with him. And I believe that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. You know, Colossian Church, I boast on you because of your reputation of love for one another. Uh, it's, it's impacting the world. But there's more. There's more that you can enjoy. And this is how I pray for you. Uh, I pray that, that you will... You will grow in your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding of, of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, that you will come to a richer, deeper understanding of that, so that it, you will abound the more and the more uh, in what God has purposed in saving you and what he has sought to accomplish uh, in and through you. So last time, as we looked at uh, verses uh, 9 through 11, oh, and again, I kind of give this subtitle or this title of substantive prayer, you know, what is the substance of that prayer? Uh, we, we learned that uh, we can pray in confidence. We can pray with anticipated results. Uh, and prayer is a, is, is a, is a powerful uh, activity of a people of God within the church. Matter of fact, it really confronts the paradox within our humanity to think that, you know, it's all of God, and yet we are to pray as if it's all of us, yet knowing it's all of God. And yet that's the desire of God that we would come with that kind of intensity seeking his face uh, in the midst of whatever it is that we're concerned about or whatever it is that we're expressing thanksgiving, that it is that true communion of relationship and, and earnestness knowing, Lord, that I, I, want, I want to be a part of that work that you're doing. And so it is so deliberate on my part, so intense on my part. And so our prayer life, we, we should never become content with our prayer life. It should always be, I can be that much deeper in my, my communion with the Lord God, and I must pray all the more intently uh, for those things that I desire of God. Again, not that I, that I think that somehow that it's dependent upon my many ritualistic prayers, but that it is in the seeking of the heart and the mind of God that I will then pray consistent with His will, and therefore I know that what I pray for will be a true yes. And so last time we learned... Uh, uh, really in verses 9 through 11, observing the Apostle Paul's prayer, uh, that we can have that kind of confidence and, and then praying, uh, anticipating <clears throat> the results. And then today as we look at verses 12 through 14, we're really going to continue our thought on prayer, uh, learning that true substantive prayer is expressed with a heart of thanksgiving. And by the way, the more that I, <coughs> more that I study through this, there's, there's a profound aspect of this that I think sometimes we miss because sometimes we think that, well, when we pray, we should be thankful, and therefore we express thanksgiving in our prayer, and that is absolutely true. But there is a, there is a thread that comes through this, and that is that when I pray, I pray with a heart of thanksgiving, knowing that what I am praying for, God will address and God will resolve, God will bring about. That the Apostle Paul, as he is he's praying for the Colossian believers, he's praying with that kind of confidence. And so what it ultimately does is it puts our faith before us and says, when you pray, what is, what is the nature of your faith in that prayer? Do you pray with such a confidence 
that you're already thanking God for the answer, though in time it has not yet come. And so it challenges us, even as mature believers uh, uh, in, in our prayer life, to say, do, do I have that kind of maturity in my prayer life that I can pray, knowing that I pray in the will of God and for the purpose of God, knowing that what I am asking for, God is, going, is sitting at the edge of heaven saying, absolutely, and so that I pray with a thankful heart saying, Lord, I know this is going to come to pass because this is your will. This is your heart's desire for us. And that's the way the Apostle Paul is praying. And I think as we go through these verses, hopefully that will come through to us. And again, what we're, we're thankful for both what God has done and what he is yet to do. And again, I think we, we get to what he has done and even what he will do in terms of future expectation. But do we often connect it even with, Lord, I know that even what I'm expressing at this very moment, I'm thankful that you're going to answer that prayer. I'm thankful that you're going to answer it, uh, in, in a, even in the manner in which I am praying, because I'm praying, as we talked about last time, in Jesus' name, in the will of God, uh, in the will of the Son, uh, I am praying. So Paul's prayer is not only a model or a pattern for believers to follow, but again, it serves as a kind of a diagnostic of our own prayer ministry uh, to one another within the church. And you know, how do we pray for one another? And do we pray with thanksgiving for one another in what God is doing in the, in the hearts and the minds of one another? Uh, when we pray, our prayers should include uh, praise as, as well as, as peti uh, petitions. And we have our little acrostics that we can often use as, to somehow remind us of that. But again, do we, do we praise God for what he is doing uh, in the life of, of one another? Uh, Paul gives the Philippians some instruction. This comes out of Philippians uh, chapter 4. And in verse, verse 6, he says this, he says, Do not be anxious about anything, uh, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Now notice the connection. Now in the English, with something. When you're doing something with it, that means the thanksgiving is coming uh, in the activity of prayer and supplication. When I'm interceding on the behalf of, of my fellow believer, I'm doing it with a spirit and a heart of thanksgiving. So not just that I'm simply remembering those things that God did the other day or has done, although I certainly should be, but even more so that I'm praying with a heart of thanksgiving, knowing that my God is going to even deal with those very things that are even, even as the words are coming off my lips or as the thoughts are going through my mind, I'm praying with thanksgiving, no, my God is going to answer this prayer. My God is going to meet this, this concern. And so we're praying with thanksgiving, again, not only for what God has done, and I'll, and I'll say it repeatedly, but also for what he will do, even as I am making that current request. We ask believing that God will answer. We do that with thankful hearts. Uh, our thanksgiving is an expression of our true confidence. Uh, it's an, an aspect of our faith in how we pray. And pa we know the Apostle Paul, he constantly gave thanks in his prayer. And I think just about every one of his letters, sooner or later, he says, I pray for you and this is how I pray. Uh, and one of those aspects is there's the, the aspect of thanksgiving. Uh, when we look at even the introduction to our, our text for today, uh, it begins with giving thanks. That uh, Paul is, I, I'm giving thanks. And of course, we, again, we, we kind of look at thanksgiving and the act of thanks and praise. And you probably struggle with this as much as I do. Do you ever notice when you sit down to make your prayer list that your requests always outweigh your praises? Right? Uh, and I, by the way, I believe there's a very real reason for that, and it comes out of the flesh, right? But we, we struggle with our praises, and you guys are, that are good at journal keeping, you're the, you're the ones that kind of have a head start on this, and that is that you can go back and look at the things that God has done, and therefore you can build that list. Uh, those short-time memory like me, you know, you know, I'm lucky to come up with a post-it note length because, you know, I'm always, I'm always aware of my immediate issues, but I struggle to reflect upon. And so giving thanks, again, it is a natural part of, of our flesh. Uh, as some would say, you know, we kind of go to God as some sort of dispensary, you know, give, give, give. We're all, you know, seeking that. But yet he invites us to do that. And so that's definitely an aspect of prayer. But there's so much more. Uh, we're quick to make our requests. We're slow to thank God for his answers. Uh, because God so often answers our prayers, we come to even expect it. You know, and I think sometimes we, we see God answer prayer. It's like, all right, let's go on to the next thing, right? Let's kind of, you know, but let's spend a little time rejoicing, right, in the moment of what God is doing and what he has done. And, uh, you know, we have miracles that sit even in this very congregation that are answers to prayer. Uh, and so we celebrate them, not, not for their, their own sake, but for what they represent to us. They represent to us the miraculous work of God in our midst. And we believe as an answer to prayer, 
by virtue of those that have, have got on their knees before God and sought uh, God's direction and healing in their, in their lives. Uh, again, we easily forget that it is only by His grace that we receive anything from Him. You know, I always like to pull that on the kids when they, they turn to another and say, I deserve, right? I want because I deserve. And I say to them, do you really want what you deserve? <laughs> Especially the ones that are knowledgeable of the scriptures, you see that great pause come over their, their eyes and they're thinking, you know, in Dumb Statements 101, I just threw one out there uh, and I got nailed on it because, no, I don't want what I deserve. And so to think that God shows himself kind towards us, that is a cause for thank. That God would even give us the time of day, if I can use that vernacular, that is a cause for thanksgiving. But how much more that this is the, the God of the universe, the creator of the universe, to a, a rebellious, hateful creation, would die for them. And not only die for them, but then to bless them. That, should we be thankful? And it should, it should be the, 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 the primary response uh, to God as an act of worship, uh, that of being thankful. Well, the scriptures teach, and by the way, folks, this is, this is kind of the point. Why do we struggle uh, with this? Why do we struggle with giving thanks? Because it is an aspect of our flesh. And that is, and we, we get this out of Romans chapter 1, verse 21. I'm not going to put it up there for you. But the scriptures teaches, teaches us that failing to give thanks, it characterizes the wicked heart. Paul tells us this in the, the, the indictment of, of unbelievers in Romans chapter 1, verse 21. He says, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. So what we're struggling with in this activity of thanksgiving is our humanity. We're struggling with the flesh. Because the flesh is more than willing to go to God as a dispensary and say, I need, give. But it does not want to acknowledge the hand that has given it to it. It does not want to acknowledge God as God. That is the war of the flesh. That is the natural man. We live in a culture and a world that we see it has been blessed by God. Every day they sit down to a meal. And yet they will not give thanks. That is the great indictment against humanity. And yet we, we wonder, why do I struggle with that? Because I too have this physical tent, this fleshly body. Uh, and it too struggles with that from time to time. So, we serve who's overcome through Jesus Christ. And hopefully as we go through this, we'll understand that this is a victory that we can live in that we can enjoy. So evil men are marked by ungratefulness. Uh, what is to make the Christian most thankful then is the work of Christ. And so when we're struggling with that, then we recognize, again, just like pausing and saying, do we have cause to be thankful? And then our minds begin to dwell on that for a moment. And, well, what has Christ done for us? Uh, I definitely have cause to be thankful. And that's what we need to do when we're confronted with that, you know, I'm going to, to the Lord as a dispensary rather than saying, Lord, thank you. Thank you for being God. Thank you for being a gracious God. Thank you for being a God who is long-suffering. Thank you for a God who is so compassionate that he is willing to give himself for me. Again, dwell upon that. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 15, Paul exclaims, Thanks to be to God for his indescribable gift. What a way to wrap the gospel up. right? It's an indescribable gift. It is so magnificent, so huge, so phenomenal, that I cannot even describe it, but thank God for it. Thank God for the gospel. Thank God for salvation. And so he gave thanks for the result of the work of Christ, again, which is our salvation. That is, that is his theme in Colossians, uh, verses 12 uh, through 14, which we're looking at today. And he sums up the doctrine of salvation in three great truths. He's going to look at our inheritance, our deliverance, and our transference, all as a result of our salvation. And for those things, he is thankful that he has done so and is doing in the life of the Colossian church. And as he rejoices... And so we begin with Paul, with the thanksgiving for, first off, in our, our inheritance. Matter of fact, we'll spend the most of our time uh, dealing with this aspect of inheritance. Uh, because each one of these you could spend quite an quite a amount of time searching the scriptures and really trying to wrap your mind around it. But when you think about it, we we are saved from condemnation. That is what we rightfully deserved. 
And if that was all that we received, that is cause for celebration and thanksgiving of God. But that's not the end. We have received an inheritance. Matter of fact, the scripture speaks of us as joint heirs with Jesus Christ. I am, I am going to share in his inheritance as the Son of God. Now, how does that work out? And so when you begin to wrap your mind around it, and this is what Paul is thanking uh, God for in the life of the Colossian church, that, that they are the recipients and are enjoying the blessings of the inheritance of God. And so we begin, really, with the object of our thanks. Uh, who do we express this thanks, thanks to? Well, certainly God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But Paul is specific here because, again, he is speaking of the gift of Christ. He is thanking for uh, God the Father. And so the Father is the, the object of the thanks. And he emphasizes the personal, relational aspect of our union with God, even to address him as Father. How is it that we, rebellious humanity, can speak to the, to the Father in the familiar of, of one who is our Father. Now, in our humanity, if anyone treated us like we treated God, we would not treat them with an affectionate term. We'd have some terms for them, but they wouldn't be affectionate. But yet our God allows us, invites us, calls us, saves us for, the, so that we might address him as Father. And so we turn to him as the object of our thanksgiving giving thanks to him. Before our salvation, by the way, God was our judge. Notice the change in our relationship. We stood condemned before him for violating his holy, just laws. But when, through the grace of God, we placed our faith in Christ, God ceased being our sentencing judge and became our gracious father. And so we call him Father. We have that affection that we can put before Abba, Father, the love the intimacy of that relationship that comes to us through Jesus Christ. So not only has God adopted us as his son, notice Paul goes on, but he has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So we, we have now been qualified. Now what is the qualifier, what is the, the requirement that we must satisfy to be in the inheritance? Well, there must be complete and total moral perfection. How many here are qualified? <laughs> it must be perfect holiness. Again, how many are qualified? None. Not a one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Not a one of us can stand before God and say, hey, you know, I'm the, I'm the exception. And he'll say, oh, pride, no. <laughs> So we, we, we look at this qualification in which we have been granted, uh, and it is a work of God the Father. It is He who has qualified us. Qualified means to make sufficient, to empower, to authorize, to make fit. How is it that we now are perfect in the eyes of God the Father? We are now qualified to be in His presence by the gracious work of Jesus Christ. And it is for that that Paul expresses thanksgiving. He is thanking God that for the Colossian believers, this is a reality. Again, we are not qualified through our own efforts. God has qualified us through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Uh, before God saved us by his grace, we were truly unqualified for our inheritance. I mean, we couldn't be any more unqualified for our inheritance. Quick walk through Ephesians when we describe our helpless condition. Note this. This comes out of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. This is your previous state of condition. Paul says this to the Ephesians. He says, and you were dead uh, in the trespasses and sins. Dead. He goes on. He says, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now of the work of, of the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. And if you know Jesus Christ, what you are looking at is your former resume. Dead. Helpless. Hopeless. A child of wrath. This is the condition of humanity. He goes on down in uh, chapter twelve, or excuse me, verse twelve of chapter two of Ephesians. He says, "Remember, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of, of promise, having no hope and without God in the world." 
That is our previous condition. Anybody feeling qualified? It is sin that separates. It is a condition of hopelessness. As a matter of fact, even go back to the, the previous passage. I mean, what can a dead person do? Paul's point. By the way, there's a little point, a thing here to pick up in verse 12. Notice the Apostle Paul speaking to Christians, and he's telling them, remember this. Remember this. Remember what you once were. Remember what, what it is that, that Jesus Christ has accomplished. You were once dead, but now you're alive. You were once a child of wrath, but now you're a, you're a child of God. You were once separated from Christ, but now you can be in that abiding relationship with Christ. You were once hopeless, but now you not only have a hope, you have a confident expectation that everything that God has promised will be a reality for you. What a difference. What a difference. And it is, this is the qualifier. How is it that we get from that condition to this magnificent condition of being a child of God? Well, one more. This comes from Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 17 through 19. Again, Paul speaking, he says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Uh, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Now, there's, there, by the way, there's an instruction in this passage. First off, we notice our former condition. But notice what Paul is saying. Now back in chapter 2, he said, remember, remember your former condition. But what is he saying to, to them now? Don't do this anymore. This is no longer a part of who we are. Why? Because that's not who you are. You are now a child of God. And so we have, we have this, this to be thankful. This is what God has qualified us out of. In every way, hopeless. In every way, lost. In every way, dead. And yet now, I am one who can stand before God the Father as one who is acceptable uh, in his sight. Well, in summary of that point, before our salvation, we were dominated by the evil world system, its wicked ruler, Satan, and our fallen sinful human natures. That was who we were. We were Christless, uh, stateless, uh, covenantless, hopeless, godless. Our minds were given to futility. Our understanding was darkened. We were cut off from the life of God, ignorant, hardened, callous, immoral, impure, and greedy. The only thing we were qualified to receive from God was his wrath. And yet, and here is why Paul's giving thanksgiving, so God has, by grace, qualified the unqualified to share in the inheritance. And that's where we stand today. As a matter of fact, the Greek text literally reads, for the portion of the lot. By the way, there's a subtlety here, which means that we each receive our own individual allotment or portion of the total inheritance. But each and every child of God is, by God, going to receive a particular inheritance. So your name is there. My name is there. May we walk worthy of that inheritance. May we, we demonstrate faithfulness to that inheritance. And just as the Israelites received their inheritance in the promised land, so also do we receive our portion of the divine inheritance. And again, if you want to study the scriptures and say, what does that look like? Well, let me give you a quick overview here. Matthew chapter 19, verse 29. What is that inheritance? Let's dwell on this for a moment. The scriptures have much to say about our inheritance, and I'm just going to give you a few points. It consists, first off, of eternal life. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19, uh, in verse 29. He says, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. So eternal life is far more than some sort of endless existence. By the way, if you think eternal life or the life to come is going to be boring, uh, you need to reread the text, Right? But it is a quality of life. It is Christ's life lived within the believer. And more on that in a moment. Because when we speak of eternal life, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you possess now eternal life. It's not a package you're waiting to arrive. It is here now you possess eternal life. 
So not only does it include eternal life, secondly, our inheritance includes the earth. Do you ever think of this? You're going to inherit the earth. In the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord said that believers would inherit the earth. This comes out of Matthew 5, 5. Uh, the focus on the future aspect of our inheritance when we will rule with Christ in the millennial kingdom. Those that have been here on Tuesday mornings, we've been kind of looking at some of this. What's it going to be like in that future kingdom? What are we going to be doing in that future kingdom? Well, right now we're getting a strong sense of what the Jewish nation is going to be. They're going to be there. And they're going to be the people of God. And he will be their God and they will be his people. And, and he will show himself fulfilling everything he ever promised. And we too will be in that, in that great crowd there. So the knowledge that we will inherit the restored earth should free us from any present uh, pursuit of material possessions. By the way, this is supposed to answer you. If you have that materialistic impulse in you, right, and you're struggling with that, you know, this is kind of like the kid who's, who's, who's trying to grab the few crumbs of dirt that are on the floor as if somehow there's something precious to hold on to when they've got the whole backyard to play in, right? You've got the whole thing coming. Someday we will receive far more than we could ever gain in this life. And by the way, then you won't even care. You'll be with the Lord. It'll be simply an opportunity to give him glory. Third, we will inherit all the promises of God. Uh, the writer of Hebrews exhorts us to be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Interesting thought here. What is he saying? That by believing in their faith uh, and by waiting for those things, they are going to ultimately enjoy the blessing of the promises. And so when we read the scriptures, we read those scriptures saying what, what is yet future is as sure as done. I believe it because God has declared it. I have that confident expectation. And so it's not a hope that I hope the weather will turn out nice tomorrow, but it will be a confident expectation that indeed what God has promised will come, come to pass. Well, let's get back to our text here. When do we receive our inheritance? Well, this word qualified here, it doesn't really come through in the English, but it literally indicates that we have this inheritance now. We have it now. We have already been transferred from the domain of darkness into Christ's kingdom. We'll see that a little later here in Colossians chapter 13. He says, we are, we are already fellow heirs with Christ. The full possession of that inheritance, however, is yet future. Now, there's, there's a future aspect to it. Peter even refers to it as an inheritance which is imperishable and un.